Hi, we have a lot of things that we want to share with you, and today's message is just one of them. I want to invite you to come and participate in our services here. Join us here every Sunday morning at 9.30 for our Bible study. We have different speakers that come, and you, I think you'll enjoy them. Matter of fact, today's message is also one of those. I have a special message for you each and every Sunday morning at 10.30 right here at Crossroads, which meets at Theater 3, 2800 Ruth Street and Howell, right here in Uptown Dallas. So if you have this Sunday off, come and visit with us, and let's go to the service right now. We've come into this place today, Lord, to bless you, to give you glory, to magnify you, to lift you up above everything else in our lives. So we say, Come, now is the time to worship. Come, come, now is the time to give.
prepare for the holiday season. This is actually the second Sunday of Advent. But for those of us who are not in the liturgical church, this is the time that we announce the coming of Christ as the baby. This is one of my favorite worship Christmas songs. You hear it in the mall, you hear it all the time. And we get to sing it together. Oh, come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come ye, oh, come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the King of Feel your heart 
we're in this season, this holiday season, we ask for your anointing, your covering. We want to know you. We don't want to just have a great holiday. But we want to know you, Jesus, in the fullness of your power, in the power of your resurrection. Lord, hear our hearts today. Meet needs that are spoken, that we know about, and needs that we have no idea about. God, I pray your anointing on this, your church, Crossroads Community Church in Dallas, Texas. Thank you for hearing us when we pray. Thank you for the power of agreement. Thank you that we walk in peace knowing that you are Lord of our lives. Because Lord, we want to sit at your feet. Come on. I want to sit at your feet, drink from the cup in your hand, lay back against you. Father, we just bring you glory and honor today. And we give you all the praise and all of the honor in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen and amen. We'll give everybody a big squeeze around the neck. Show the love of God up and down the road this morning. I tell you, it's good to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen. young man right here. Not going to say how it is. If he wants you to know, he'll tell you. Okay. Don't need to say happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to my man. Happy birthday to in church today. I am glad I am here. I'm glad I'm here. How many of you are glad you're in church today? I am. Kathy and Marvin, you got a little running errand real quick. They will be back just shortly. But you know what? I am glad that you're here today. I've got a great message today. Amen. I've got a great message today. So let's take a moment. Let's, you know, uh, first off, I want to pray for Brian uh, Perry and his mom. His mom has not been well this week at all. She has been, she's in the hospital right now. They, they took her in last night. She had just gotten out of rehab. She was doing really well, got home, and has had all kinds of complications. They've had all kinds of struggles with her all week. So that's where they are. So let's just take a moment. Let's, let's, let's just extend our faith to them. And uh, yes. Father God, right now, in Jesus' name, Father, we just speak healing right now over over Brian's mom right now in the hospital. Father, we just thank you that you are our healer from the top of our head all the way down to the soles of our feet. Father, she is a believer, and Father, she deserves to be healed 
in Jesus' name. So, Father, we speak wholeness and health over her being right now in Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said amen, amen and amen and amen. So let's take a moment and let's just worship the Lord with our giving. You know what? I like Christmas. It's all about giving. It's all about worshiping the Lord and understanding that, you know what? He loves us first, didn't he? He gave to us, and now we have an opportunity to worship him with our giving. So, Heavenly Father, right now, we thank you for this moment that we have to come before you. Father, to lay our gifts down before you to worship you. Father, you brought the greatest gift of any, of any into our life when you gave us Jesus. And, Father, we just thank you for that today. And there can never be enough thanks. But, Heavenly Father, we worship you now with our giving, and we do it now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' mighty name, and everyone said, amen. amen and amen and amen. Is your honey flying today? Okay. I figured he was because I didn't. He was, he was someplace, and he got, he, he, wrote me, he wrote me Friday, I guess, or yesterday, and said that he had a trip out. So pray for me. I'm leaving today, going to Philadelphia. Don't want to go, but I'm going <laughs> today. This is my last business trip of the year, and I am so excited to be over, to be over, to be over. God's good, isn't he? He's good when? All the time. He is good all the time, all the time, all the time. Well, I've got a message today, and uh, it's uh, about guilt. How many have ever had some guilt? Anybody here? Well, I want you, everybody say, remember the duck. Say it with me. Remember the duck. Say it with me again. Remember the duck, because this is a message about a duck. So I want you to what? Remember, Remember the, the duck. duck. Okay. Well, because really, first off, it is about a duck, and it is about uh, a slingshot. There's a little guy by the name of Johnny, and he was given a beautiful slingshot, as you can see. It's very beautiful. Slingshot for his birthday, and... Uh, his birthday was like in May, and he was going to go. He and his sister, Sally, were going to go visit their grandma for the summer. How many of you visited grandmas during the summer? I did. I don't know if it's our parents' way of getting rid of us for a month or what. If our grandparents really wanted us, I couldn't really tell. But my sister and I used to go and spend, spend a couple of... My sister loved it because my grandmother would make the best chicken and dumplings ever in town. I never really liked the dumplings. I always ate the chicken. But uh, we would go, and little Johnny and his sister, Sally, would go. To visit their grandma and their grandmother had a pet duck that was just wonderful it was all her her best little buddy followed her around and that duck was just wonderful well one day Johnny was outside and he was uh, practicing with his slingshot and he decided that he was going to take aim at the duck so he picked up a rock put it in there he knew he wouldn't hit it but he did and he killed it and his thought was you know what am I going to do what am I going to do because I feel I have killed grandma's pet. I've killed grandma's pet. So what did he do? He took the little body of the little duck and took it to the wood pile way back behind the barn and hid it underneath some wood. Well, while he was doing that, he looked up and his sister Sally was right there and saw it all. And she said, what are you going to do? What, what, what are you going to do? Uh, this is grandma's pet. What are you going to do? He said, well, I'm not going to tell her. I'm not going to do anything about it. Okay. So they went inside. And grandma had fixed dinner. And uh, grandma said, hey, Sally, I want you to help me with the dishes in the kitchen. And Sally said, oh, you know what? Johnny wanted to help you. Johnny told me he wanted to help you. And Johnny said, I, and she said, remember the duck. And Johnny says, oh, yeah, I wanted to help you. Looked at his sister and gave her a bad, you know, all summer long. Everything that Sally was supposed to do, Johnny had to do because all she had to say was what? Remember the duck. How many have ever done something wrong? Did you hear that echoing in the back of your head? Did you hear it echoing back in the back of your head? Remember the duck. Remember the duck. You know, he felt guilty. I don't know. You know, I've done some things in my life that I felt guilty for. But I always learned that if I just ask God to forgive that, 
I didn't remember it very much anymore because I realized that God came to bring forgiveness to me, to everyone. But the point is, is that, you know what? Uh, we've got to stop remembering that duck. And the only way you can do it is to cleanse that away from you. Let's take a look here in, Rome, in this is Revelation 12, verse 10. It says, for the accuser, everybody say the accuser. Who is the accuser? The devil. Satan is. Sure. So it says that he is the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before God day and night has been hurled down. You know what? He doesn't have any power anymore. He doesn't have any power anymore. But he will come. It's like uh, when, when I was with uh, my in-laws, my father-in-law was a firm believer in a thing called a tickler file. Anybody ever heard of that before? It's like a CPA kind of a thing. It's a file, a little card cabinet, and all the things that were important to you, you're supposed to put them on there and keep them in a chronological order. Every time you took care of one, you just kind of pitched it. Well, it's like the devil has a tickler card on everybody. And what he does is when you start to make great strides in life, he's, it's like he pulls out one of these cards and waves it in front of your face and re remember this? Remember when you did that? And he pull another one. You forgot that one. He'll put, oh, I, I know what you remember. Remember this one. It's like waving this in front of you, trying to get you to remember, trying to get you to feel guilt anymore. But you know what? We don't have to feel guilt anymore. You know, the Bible says that all have sinned, so we know that we all struggle with this. We all struggle with, you know, scenarios and situations that the enemy wants to come in and to remind us, you know what, that, that this is all bad, all bad, all bad. What you've done is all bad. But in reality, everybody's done something bad. Not anybody's better than anybody else. So when somebody comes up and they begin to try to, to look down upon you because they feel like they're so spiritually higher, remember that, you know what, it's just like the old saying is they put their shoes and socks on just like everybody else and they've got the same problems, they've got the same situation and you shouldn't allow anybody to remind you about the duck. Because first off, it's not about the duck. It's about how to get rid of the duck. I thought it was interesting, Billy Graham made a statement one time. He said, everywhere he went, he saw a universal sense of guilt. And that's the reason why when he had altar calls, people just came. Thousands, because he made it so easy for people to realize that God loved them beyond those faults, the sins and the things that people have done. He reminded them about how much God did love them. And when we're reminded of that, you know, no matter who it is that's bringing up, remember the duck, remember the duck, pretty soon, you know what, you're going to realize that the duck has been taken care of. Because Jesus came to do what? To save us from all of the ducks in our life. All the things that we've ever done wrong, he has actually come to save us from all of that. Doctors say unresolved guilt causes people to get sick easier than anything else that they're aware of. Unresolved guilt. They said that it's a direct result of guilt that folks that have never dealt with things in their life that they've never dealt with, eats away from on the inside and causes that to cause an immune weakness because it's the stress that, that guilt causes in people. And I've seen it. I've seen it. Uh, the gentleman who married my former wife and I, the pastor, uh, it was a big church. I mean, thousands of people in the church. And I was sitting in the back of the church one day because we got there late. We'd come in, flown in on, on a Sunday morning early, and we got back just about the time for church, but the church was full, and we had to sit in the back. And my mother-in-law reached over and said hello to this a lady that was sitting in front of us, and I didn't know who this lady was. And uh, I shook her hand, and she introduced herself to me, and I won't tell you her name, but she was the pastor's wife. And her hands were all gnarled with rheumatoid arthritis. They were just, they were crippled. I mean, they were, it was hard for her to even hold her hand out and to reach and to get any kind of a handshake at all. It's more like holding her hand like that. And she'd already been to 
to Mexico to have these. They weren't legal in the, in the States. They probably still aren't now, but they were gold treatments, and they would inject gold and all kinds of stuff in her bones, trying to get the, the rheumatoid arthritis out. And it was just, you know, a bunch of stuff. She had done everything that she could do, except ask for forgiveness for the resentment that she had against her husband because he was a pastor of church, and he never introduced her. She was never mentioned nothing. But she sat back on the second to the last row almost in the church every Sunday. She was there, but he never talked about her, never mentioned her, never mentioned the fact that she had supported him in, 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 in going to school and seminary and getting his degree and all this stuff and worked with him in all the churches coming up and helping him build this church. He never, I, I would never have known her, would never have known her. But that had caused that, that resentment on the inside and that unforgiveness that she held towards her husband was like that duck. It was the thing that just kept coming up, coming up, coming up, and she just let it. She never did anything about it, never wanted to let go of it. It just causes a lot of pain, a lot of pain. You know, David had a lot of ducks in his life. Matter of fact, he makes a statement here in Psalm 32. Let's, that one, let's go back here. It says, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped in, as in the heat of summer. David knew that he had done so many things, and God just kept wanting him to deal with it, deal with it, deal with it. You remember when he had the son by Bathsheba? Nine months, they were waiting for this little child. And he was wearing sackcloth and ashes because he knew that he had done wrong. He knew that he'd done wrong. He knew that he'd done wrong. He knew that, you know, here it is. The prophet came to him and said, and talked about the story about, you know, here's a guy who has all of these sheep. He has all of these sheep, but he saw this little shepherd with one, and he went after that one. And David heard the story. And he said, you know what? Well, we just need to hang that guy up. We just need to kill him. And the prophet said, you're that person because you had taken Bathsheba when you had all these, all these wives already. David knew that there was a problem. And that whole time, that whole time, incubating that, incubating that child was tearing him up every single day because he was confronted with that. And here the child is born, the child of sorrows that the Bible calls him, and the child dies. David gets up, cleans himself, goes about his work as being king, and people thought that he'd really tipped over the edge now because he's bound to be crazy now because the child has died. He was, he was sick and of sorrow all these nine months, and now that the baby's gone, he's like over the top. He's just gone back because he'd asked God to forgive him, finally. Finally. He didn't have to wait all that time. He didn't have to go through all of that. He could have gotten rid of all of that at the very beginning. It just that he just seemed to like carrying it on, carrying it on, carrying it on, and he never wanted to deal with it. That was a big duck to him, and it just kept going on. You know, behavioral scientists, I don't know if you've ever heard of those before, but it's people who study how we operate and act as human beings, made a statement that says, cognitive dissidence is the conflict between our minds when we believe one thing but act in a different way. We believe one thing, but we act in a different way. And it really comes down to the fact we think one way and we act another way. And I think that's, you know, for a lot of people who are in, uh, still in the closet. They haven't reconciled the fact that God loves them just the way they are. So they still try to maintain this one thing, but on the inside, they're really something else, really something else. And they haven't decided that, you know what, that God loves them just the way they are. I'm glad that God does love us just the way we are and that I don't have to worry about whether or not when I get up in the morning, does he love me? Or when I get on a plane, does he love me? Am I going to stay in the air? All this kind of stuff. Do you really believe that he loves you? He loves us so much that he paid a price for our sin that we could never pay. You know, I sit there and think oftentimes about the fact, that, you know what, I've got four wonderful daughters and uh, as much as I love people like Doug over here, I would never let one of my kids die for him. 
I wouldn't. Because I love them. But I can't imagine God sending his only son to people who would end up doing a, a, a Paris or doing a San Bernardino. I don't know that I could, I have a hard time wrapping my mind around the fact that God loved those people as much as he loves us. I just think it's amazing. And when I think about the fact that we're getting ready to celebrate the birth of Christ, the entrance of that into this world, I just am reminded the fact that, you know what, that the Bible really has given us an answer for that. Matter of fact, this really is the, this is what says, either we need to change, this is the, what the world says, either we need to change what we do so it fits how we think, or we need to change how we think so it fits what we do. That's the world's answer to cognitive dissonance because it says that you cannot live at peace until these things have become clear and distinct. You have to bring your action with the way you think into alignment. He says that's the only way you can find peace. People will not have peace. They'll live in all this turmoil all going on while all this dissonance, it's like the lack of harmony. But the Bible gives us another thing. The Bible logic says to repent, change what we do or think in order to what? To please God. It's not about pleasing ourselves. It's about pleasing Him. So when I think about changing our life, you know, I remember the guy who outed me. He was a business associate. And he had left a message on my cell phone, which my former wife picked up. And it was about an encounter that he and I had. And he to this day thinks that he has done me the greatest favor on earth. Now part of that could possibly be true in the fact that it forced me to live who I am and where I don't have to worry about slipping away from that protective covering of perfection and everything that we think that the world wants to see out of us. What it did, it took away all of the cognitive dissonance in my life. And my daughter even made a comment about it when my uh, when she was getting married, my, my, my first partner and I were there at the wedding, and she made, a, she made a comment to my former partner. She said, you know, I've never seen my dad so peaceful in his whole life. This is while everybody was there coming up, and lots of people from my old big church in North Dallas were there, and I was just like, I was like a cat in a room full of rocking chairs. I was just really nervous about the whole deal. Didn't really want to run into them. Didn't want to have to answer any questions. Didn't want to have to be confronted with anything. Amidst all that, my daughter makes the comment, I've never seen my dad so peaceful and so calm in her whole life. And she followed that up by, I guess he's not having to be two people all the time now. And that's really true, really too. To come to an understanding, you know what, that I don't have to be perfect for somebody else. I've just got to maintain my life to God, and that's all that's important, to take care of my life before Him. So, you know, when I think about living my life before people, we're getting ready to come into a political situation here in our country that I think is really, I don't know what God's going to do in the midst of the world scenario and our home scenario and who the choices are that we have to pick for president. Because you know, political people have a way of dealing with guilt that's unlike just about anybody else. Matter of fact, I've got some of the things that they're down here. Politicians are very skilled at not admitting when they're wrong. How many of you ever recognize that? They will never admit that they're wrong. Why? Because this is what they do, they play the blame game. The first one is, their idea is not to get caught. Not to get caught. I remember I was around when, when I'm sure some of the rest of us were, when Richard Nixon was just denying, 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 denying everything about Watergate. Denied it all, denied it. Even went to the extent of cutting out tape so that people couldn't hear it. 
But if you get caught, deny it. Deny. Just keep on denying. Keep on denying. You know, and then if they don't do that, they employ this righteous indignation. You know, they come across and they make, they make a statement. How could you ever think that I would do something like that? And platitudes, you know, they just come up with all that kind of stuff. And then if they can't do that, they just cover up and delay responding to the accusation. They just think if they don't say anything, it'll just like go away. Just don't say anything. Little Johnny just didn't want to say anything about it because he just thought that the duck would go away. It would just go away. Unfortunately, that duck probably began to smell under that, that summer woodshed back there in the back. Or they'll say something like, you know, they'll begin to minimize the situation, you know, and they'll say, yes, I did wrong, but you know, there are other people who've done worse than me. They'll begin to do this kind of teetering back each other. They'll begin to compare themselves with, you know, some, uh, some really bad person out there to make themselves look not quite so bad. But there are other people, other people who've been really, really bad, really, really bad. And if that doesn't work, they deflect responsibility to other people. You know, I did wrong, but it's not my fault. You know, I think about all of the situation ethics that our country goes through in all of its court cases when someone kills a bunch of people, they always say, it's not my fault, it's my granny's fault. She slapped me when I was three years old and that did this to me and now I just wanna go out and kill everybody. Well, unfortunately, granny didn't pull the trigger. Granny didn't go in there with all of these arms and all these you know, munitions and do that. You did that. It's hard to put that back, but politicians will, will do that. They'll, they'll, if, they'll try to blame other people. They'll try to do it. You know. And so I guess the thing is, how many have ever done something bad? How many have ever told a lie? Did something bad? Hurt somebody's feelings? Yeah. Afterward, did you have something going off on the inside? Did you have something going off on the inside saying, shouldn't have done that, shouldn't have done that. That hurt them. You shouldn't have lied, you shouldn't have lied. There's something that's going on the inside. That's a good thing that that's going off on the inside. That's a good thing. Can you imagine how bad it would be if you hurt somebody and you didn't feel bad about it? That you lied to somebody and you didn't feel bad about it? You kill somebody? No, I don't feel bad. That's, you know, that's psychotic. So it is a good thing that we feel bad when we do something wrong because that's like God saying, you know what? You really are connected with me. I still have a connection with you. It's important to do that. So, you know, then guilt really is, a, is a, not such a bad thing. Or is it a bad thing? I think guilt is really bad that we carry it, but guilt is not so bad that it doesn't, remind us that there's something that we need to do about that, that duck. Well, how many of you remember the story about Adam and Eve? You know, here's Eve, she's in the garden. The serpent comes up, the devil comes up to her and says, you know, did God tell you to eat? of all the trees except this one, or did he say maybe this one? Or how about that one over there? All of these trees you can eat from, but which one? Now which one was it? Trying to get her to kind of look around, maybe that wasn't the one that I was supposed to eat. Anyway, so she took a bite of that, and she ate it, and then she gave it to Adam, and Adam didn't even think twice about it. He just took a bite out of it and just started chowing down on it. And there was a problem that came as a result of that. You know, he makes a statement when God comes looking for them. He said, well, she gave it to me. You know, wanting to push it off on somebody else. She gave it to me. Why isn't it her fault? It's her fault. It's not my fault. It wasn't my fault at all. Matter of fact, God, it's your fault. You gave her to me. I think that's a funny way to put it. It's all God's fault. First off, he made the tree. He didn't want me to eat for it. He shouldn't have, eaten, shouldn't have made that tree. There are a lot of things that people try to come up with to push the blame to other people to make it look like it's their fault, pushing it away, pushing it away, pushing it away. 
even Adam, all the way back to the very beginning. Adam was one of those people who wanted to blame everybody but himself. Nobody wants to take responsibility. I guess my question was, was Adam right to try to push it off? And I'll tell you, no, it wasn't. Adam sinned because Adam made the choice to take a bite. Johnny, he pulled back on that slingshot. Now, he didn't know if he'd hit the, hit the duck or not, but he did, and then wasn't willing to openly admit to it. They did a study, which I think was interesting. The United States and Israel did a study, a joint study, and it was on repentance. And it was actually written up in the Harvard Business School. I think I've got it. Do I have it here? No. I guess I left that one out. But this, oh, it's coming up. Let's do this, this, this verse here. Proverbs 28, 13 says, Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain what? Mercy. Mercy. We've got this mercy that's available to us. God brought Jesus into the world so that we could obtain mercy through him, because if not, we would certainly die. We would certainly die. Look at this verse here. David makes this comment. He says, I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. So David understood. He says, you know what? Even though I did all this bad stuff, at the very end, he said, you know what? I did decide to come clean, and God forgave me. The study that I was talking about was with over 4,000 test subjects. The doctors asked them, the psychiatrists asked them to confess to something that they had never confessed any, to anybody else. Tell me something that you've never told anybody else. And they kind of measured that. They said, how do you feel now that you've told me? And the people said, oh, I, I, I guess I feel better. The problem was, they made this statement that says, researchers found that if the subjects only partly confessed, in part felt worse than those who made a full confession of their guilt. So it's like, oh, you know, I did this. I, I took some money from somebody. Well, they didn't say how much, and they, didn't, they killed two or three people along the way, but they just took the money. They didn't confess to the whole thing. It's not about, you know, holding back. David could have said, well, you know, I... I I, I did look over there and I did lust at her and I did sin when I lusted at her and you know he didn't have to confess yeah I did take her and yes we did have sex and yes we did have a child and that child died but see the thing that I think is so important about that is that David asked for forgiveness and the next child that David and Bathsheba have this thing that came from so much bad him lusting after her, having her husband killed, having a relationship with her, having a child with her, that first child dying, all the bad stuff. When he confessed to all of that, God turned all the bad around and gave them Solomon, who wrote Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, who built the temple. I mean, a lot of good can come from bad, but we have to be willing to say, own up and say, you know what? Yeah, I, I did that. That was me. That was me. But here it says, this is in the Harvard Business Review, summarized that the research this way. It says, confession is a powerful way to relieve guilt, but it works only if you tell the whole truth. Only if you tell the whole truth. I thought about that. My mother-in-law came to my mind again. I think I've told this story not too recently, but I did tell this story. She and my former wife were going to a Methodist church and they weren't getting a whole lot out of that church. And this little guy kept coming to her and asking her to, to do their printing. A little, little, it was a little Nazarene church, I'll go ahead and say it. A little, little impoverished Nazarene church, had a very small little building. And uh, the, the pastor of this church would come in and said, well, listen, would you print my church bulletins for us? Because we really don't have the money to do it. Maybe you could do it, you know, 
we'll give you a tax receipt for it or something. And my mother says, oh yes, we can certainly help this little weakling church and we'll print their bulletins. Well, they printed the bulletins. Well, it went on and on and on and they started striking up a great relationship and, and so suddenly he started bringing his messages in that were on cassette tape and asking her to, to type them out. Well, my mother-in-law mother had a 110 word accuracy kind of a thing. She just blared it out. She had perfect typing and she could just bang the thing out. And all of that was going inside of her. All of that that he was speaking on Sunday about holy living and, and that was one of the key, keystones of, of the Nazarene church. She kept hearing that, hearing that, hearing that, and how, how, how we're supposed to follow after God. She kept hearing that, hearing that, because faith comes by what? Hearing. hearing and hearing by what? Word of God. She kept hearing this every week after week after week. And she'd never been to his church. And my mother-in-law and uh, former wife were traveling up uh, 95 up from Miami, they were going up to Cocoa Beach and it was a horrible rainstorm and this car careened off, came back, plowed into the side of them and uh, she hit her head against the side of the window shield, didn't break it or anything. And matter of fact, no one even thought that anybody had been really hurt and really injured. And so they didn't put any claim or anything like that. But six months later, she was blinded in the eye because it had dislodged the the lens in her eye just became weaker and weaker and weaker. And she eventually lost the sight in both of her eyes. And so when she was going to have surgery to replace the lens in her eye, this little pastor of this little church came to her and was going to see her and pray for her before she went into surgery. And as she was laying there on the gurney, she was already going under anesthesia, so she wasn't really talking really good. She was a little slurred. Well, my mother-in-law was great about martinis. I mean, she slapped them back. She would tell you today if she were here, she said she drank like a sailor, and she did. She cursed like one, too, and smoked like one. She would have no, no, no hesitation telling you that, so I would tell you that. And so he thought that she was already sauced going in. And she looked up at him and said, you know, the first place I go when I get out of here is to your church. Well, he thought she was just drunk and wasn't going to remember anything. Well, she came out and, and they had fixed her eye and she was having to wear a patch for, for several weeks while her eye was healed. And that next Sunday that she was out of the hospital, they were, they were there. Well, they got there late. So the only place left at that church was where? Front row. Front row. So they sat down in the front row and he would preach to her. He would... He wasn't preaching to her. He was really preaching to everyone else. And he'd make a statement like, you know, what, what do you put first? And he'd always put her, his finger pointing right at her. What do you, do you put liquor first? You know, it really wasn't happening. He wasn't pointing to her, but it felt to her like he was pointing to her. And she said, she said I'm never going back to that church again. She'd take a puff out of that cigarette on the parking lot and she'd peel out on the parking lot and say, I'm never going back to that church. Well, God would bring her back next week. Pull her back in. Pull her back in. And she said, you know, I just feel like there's something missing. Well, this pastor gave her a little four spiritual law. The old form, little four spiritual law pamphlet that we used to give out tracts all the time. And in there it says, you know, it says, I confess that I'm a sinner. She's well, God, I, you know I've never sinned. And she'd tell God, you know I've never sinned. And she'd read the whole thing, and she said she probably read it thousands of times. But she would never admit that she was a sinner. And then finally, one day, God reminded her of a penny that she had stolen from her, mo her, her mother's pocketbook. And she said, Lord, forgive me, for I am a sinner. And said that prayer, and her whole life changed. Her whole life changed. Stop drinking, stop smoking, stop. She used to go to the Fontainebleau there in, in Miami and dance. She would tell you the holy gully. That's how old this, this story would be. If she were here, I'd tell you about it. But it changed her life because she realized that God had sent something, someone, to take away all of that guilt of all of the things. And then all of a sudden he said, you know, God, did you, she makes a statement in her book, God, did you see that? And God said to her, I've seen everything you've ever done. I've heard everything you've ever said. And I've felt and thought everything you've ever thought. 
And that's when she said, Lord, forgive me for I am a sinner. So we're reminded that's that thing going off on the inside of us, you know, that it's all about that. How many have ever had a little light go off on your dashboard? The car that my dad sent me away to was a 62 Chevrolet Impala. Well, I was driving up between Wichita Falls and uh, Tulsa. That's the Will Rogers turnpike that goes up that way. So there's not a lot of stops. You just kind of keep going. There's like two or three stops between cities. And uh, I saw the light go off that it was overheating. And I said, I've seen my dad's driven that with that running like that. I'm just going to go. I'll make it. I'll make it. I'll make it to Tulsa and I'll get something to fix. I'll get it fixed there. Well, it choked down at Stroud. If you know where Stroud, Oklahoma is, it's about halfway between Tulsa. And I'm stuck there now and I can't get anywhere. I can't get back to school. My dad's, I, you know, I'm going to call him and tell him. He's going to ask what happened to that, and I'm going to tell him, yeah, the water heater, um, the water, water pump probably went out. And I'm going to hear the lecture about why didn't I pay attention to that light. Well, see, that light is a reminder that there's something wrong, and that we really should be taking care of that. There should be something taking care of that. You know, and... And when we feel that thing going off on the inside of us, that's God saying, you know what, there's something here that needs to be taken care of. There's actually something going on on the inside that's not quite right. Now, the world's solution to that is to take a piece of duct tape and put it over the light so the light doesn't blink at you. That's the world's way of taking care of it. But we know that that's not going to get us where we need to be. But you know what? Remember the story about Johnny? close to the end of summer and Johnny has just about had it with his sister Sally. She has had him doing dishes two or three times a day all summer long and she's just enjoying it. She's enjoying it. She says, remember the duck. Remember the duck. Well finally Johnny has felt so bad because grandma's gone out and looked for the duck kind of passively. I wonder where that duck could be. And he finally decided, I'm going to go in there and tell her what I've done. And he goes in and he says, Granny, I, I, I've got something to tell you. You know, you've been looking for the duck. Well, I killed the duck. She said, I know. I saw it happen right out the window. I forgave you then. Because I love you. And I don't want you to worry about that duck. And she said, she followed up by saying, I was wondering how long you were going to take all that from Sally before you decide to cough it up. <laughs> but isn't that the truth about life, though? God's already forgiven us. He's already said, you're forgiven. I loved you so much that I forgave you when it happened. But yet we will go for so long and the devil will constantly remind you, remember the duck, remember the duck, remember the duck. And we'll forget that he's already forgiven us. That that great God of ours has already forgiven us. This right here. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, that sounds, that's, is that oversimplified? Does that sound like it's too oversimplified? You know, there's no in there, I got to do this, got to do that, got to say this many prayers, got to do this, got to do that. It doesn't say anything. It just says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if that isn't enough, there's a scripture in the Old Testament. It's in a very, very small little book, a few pages long. It's actually from the book of Micah. And it says, God will cast all our iniquities in the depth of the seas, never to be remembered again. 
that when those happen, he hurls them never to be reminded of them again. As far as away from him, he can throw them. That's where they are. And he says they remain there and he forgets them. So the accuser really is that one who constantly reminds us of what's happened. It's never God. It's never God doing that. So in this time, this time of the year that we're coming into, we celebrate the birth of our forgiveness. The things that, the things that we've done, all the accusations that the enemy tries to bring in, we need to be reminded, this is the time that we celebrate because the great hope has come, has come to the earth. What a thing. You know, God's, God really doesn't ask too much. He just says, if you confess it, all of it. Don't keep some of it because that's what the enemy will use to beat you up with. It's just good to get it all out and to let it go. Who cares? He knew it when it happened. Heavenly Father, this morning, we are so grateful that you've already forgiven us. When Jesus came, the work was just about over. When he died on the cross, it was complete. Our salvation in you is complete. All we had to do was to confess our sins. And you know what? You were more than willing. You saw it when it was done. You loved us and you forgave us right then. So Father, we choose not to remember the duck anymore. That duck just doesn't matter because your love is overflowing. Your love is overflowing to us. And Father, we're reminded that of today because we can come and we can take communion with you. Having been cleansed of, of everything that we've ever done, to, to receive that wholeness that, that comes from only the understanding that your blood is the only sacrifice that ever needs to be made. Not our sleep disrupted at night, not being reminded of all the things we've ever done wrong because your love covers us. So Heavenly Father, we give you the praise this morning as we come before your table and we're reminded of how much you do love us. Father, we give you the praise and the glory for you. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen and amen. This morning is Communion Sunday. So I Hi, and thank you for watching today's service. As I spoke to you at the beginning, we have a couple of outreaches, which I think are important for you to know that we're participating in, and you might want to join us. We've got one, which is our orphanage in Uganda. It's 320 children, about, that have been left there because their parents have either died or are affected by HIV AIDS. There are no relatives that will take them in because it's such a stigma to have HIV or even to be gay there in Uganda. We also have a church in Tegucigalba, Honduras. It's just a starting work, but there is a lot that we can do to help them. And if you'd like to join and be a part of that, we invite you to go to our webpage, www.crossroadscommunitychurch.us, and you'll see a tab there that says donation. You can make your donation through PayPal. It's secure, and we'll get that, and we'll send it on to them. So if you'd like to participate, we thank you for doing it in advance because we know that God is going to bless you. Thank you for watching today, and tune in next week.